Yeah, yeah, what it is, people? It's your boy, Doggy Diamonds. You already know Doggy Diamonds TV, and I'm here with one of my favorite producers. Oh, wow. Super duper, like, whooper, trooper, <laughs> pooper, scooper, whatever. <laughs> we got to come up with all types of oopers. Uber, let them know who you are. Uh, what's good, people? My name is Focus. I'm with the Aftermath crew. Uh, just a music maker and a producer, and I'm honored to be here. Doggy Diamonds. So when they, all right, they, you say focus. Mm -hmm. They might say who? Give them where they definitely know you from musically. Uh, you would know my production from records like uh, Respect My Conglomerate, um, uh, Yes for Beyonce, you already know for 112, and you probably know me best for my stint with uh, Aftermath, and I'm rocking with them now. Uh, we just did Compton, so I did some work on there as well. And I and and you held back on some records too that they definitely know. Hmm. My favorite one, where I'm from. Oh wow, for game, yes. Yeah, where I'm yeah. from, like that just changed the whole vibe of the album. Like I, I needed that vibe. When, I appreciate that. When you're producing, mm -hmm. do you make the beat prior to getting with the artist, or do you get with the artist and start cooking from there? It depends. Um, a lot of times, uh, I do have. A skeleton made um, where I'm from was made before I got with game uh, you already know it was made before I got with 112 yes was made before I got with Beyonce but um, I built records like uh, the I recently worked with snow the product and I built that for her um, and it just depends on what the projects asking me to do and if I need to build from from scratch I, I would prefer it because it has both me and the artists or writers um, kind of DNA in the track so has there ever been a point where you made a beat and the artist didn't like it and you tweaked it for them or you just like, no, this is the beat and you're going to like it or I'll give it to somebody else? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's <laughs> been a couple of times like that. And um, being honest, I never force my music down anybody's throat because I know that this it's going to be a, uh, a horrible composition once it's all put together. So uh, I want everybody to uh, love it. I don't even want them to like it. I want them to love it. So where's Focus from? Like, cause, cause your sound, um, judging from your sound, I would think you're from originally from the Midwest somewhere. You have like a Midwest soul swag. But where are you from? I'm originally from New York. I was born in Manhattan. Oh shit! I lived. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in the Bronx. I lived in Brooklyn, and uh, I grew up most of my uh, teenage life in uh, Stanford, Connecticut. Wow. So. Who who influences you in Stanford? Like living there, what do you listen to to get this musical vibe? It's funny. My dad was uh, the basis for Chic, so it's all I've ever known. Um, music is all I've ever known, and my dad had uh, an array of music uh, that he listened to, and I I pretty much adapted and adopted everything that he was doing. Um, so I, one of my biggest uh, mentors and people that I looked up to. Besides my father was Prince, uh, Stevie Wonder, uh, of course Teddy Riley. You know I can I can go through a whole list of people that I used to listen to just to start to find the things to imprint who I wanted to be. So your father played the Good Times bass line. Yes, sir. Whoa. Mm -hmm. All right. You probably didn't know it at the time, but do you realize how big that is right now? <laughs> yeah. As a kid, I didn't know what it was. I, I was just happy that uh, dad was working, you know what I'm saying? But um, it is one of those things that uh, as you get older, you appreciate more. And when people start to react to those things, that's kind of big. Um, I'll say that and everybody's like, whoa, are you serious? So um, I did start to appreciate it when I got older. That's one of the most scratch record by DJs. Yeah. That particular part, yeah. the most, that's the break where people rap and that's rapper's delight done yes. over yeah i know the check was pretty good like how did how did yeah. that work did, like, did you see the did, did you did you growing up did you see some of the um the 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 fruits of the labor of his work or was it shady business no, back then a hundred percent i mean my father made sure that we were taken care of as a family i'm the oldest of six siblings uh and you know my brothers and sisters and my mother were t well taken care of and we came from some hard times in Brooklyn, uh, even living with our grandmother in the Bronx to um, a, a nice big house in 
Connecticut, and, and my dad made sure that we all had whatever we needed, and that was all, you know, the fruitage of his labor. So, um, you know, my dad even made sure that we're taken care of in our adult years, you know, so he's always... Did his dad still get money from dad? <laughs> like, being honest, you know, so it really is one of those things that, uh, you know, he, he worked hard for his family, and he wanted to make sure that his legacy kept working on and on, even after his passing. So, all right, I know it's in your DNA to do music, but when did it bite you? When did you say, okay, I'm going to really actually pursue this? It's funny. I, I wanted to do music all of my life. When I was six, I started, you know, uh, thinking I was making songs. At eight, I was telling people in school that I was going to be a music producer. And all through throughout high school, I, I just was in every band. Um, if I needed to be uh, in the middle school band, I was there. If I needed to be in the upper school band, I was there. So, um, you said you was going to be a producer as a kid. Yeah. When did you say, all right, I'm a, I'm a producer. What was your first break where you stepped from aspiring to you're really in it now? If we're talking about professionally, that didn't happen until I was about 19 years old. Um, wow. 19? That's, you act yeah. like that's old or something like that. That's still rel um, relatively young. Well, it, it was, it was not... Uh, relevant or irrelevant it was just the fact that at 19 I was doing work but I wasn't getting um, I wasn't getting credit for it okay. so we all know about ghost producing we all know about um, paying your dues and back then you know we as producers and music makers were kind of really pushed behind the scenes of the ones that were really more uh, at the forefront um, you know so people call them now super producers but they were always producers that were more known than the ones that were coming up under them. Um, like you would talk about Devontae Swing versus the Timberland who yep. came up under him. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, things like that. But at the end of the day, uh, I started making a little bit of money here and there when I was 19, 20. Um, but things really got solidified for me when I moved out to Los Angeles and started getting various deals and, and doing remixes and things like that in Los Angeles. So uh, that's around, around 23, 24. So did you just pick up and go out there, or was Literally, it? Literally, yes. Yeah. So ghost production is your ghost production public, or do do people not know some of the things that you did? The funny thing about it is whether it is or isn't, I don't even know if it came out. I just know okay. that I would do uh, some drum programming here or do sounds here, or whatever, and then just get paid and asked to leave. You know. So I don't. I wouldn't even know if it was out or not. All I right. Know, yeah. Yeah, because that was a, a question that mm -hmm. I was. That what I always wanted to know from other producers. Mm -hmm. At one point, the the credits used to say produced by, but it, you would get drum programming credit. You right. would get keys paid for, played by. So that doesn't make you the producer, though. That makes you somebody who. That makes you somebody who contributed to the record. Someone that contributed to the. When record. did the terminology change to just like the producer is the producer, and you think he completely did the record? Because it used to be, drum program by Eddie F, but such and such did to be like you would know who did what. When did it change to just like I'm the producer and nobody else helped me? I think it became different, and and I was saying this. Um, Earlier in the conversation I was having with my manager, I wish I could pinpoint exactly when it was. But to me, um, and I might be wrong, but to me, it seems like when things became more in the box, more uh, computerized, uh -huh. and it was more about the superstar producer. You know, it was more about the super producer. And when it became about the super producer, we know that, you know, and it's no it's no thing that I'm, I'm pulling the, the curtain from in front of these guys, but, you know, there are people that... that aided Timbaland in where he is right now you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying so at the end of the day everybody's eyes were focused on Timbaland instead of looking at maybe in the credits there is another name or maybe the writer's credits and finding out who those people were so to me I think um, it really dawned in with the the initiation of the super producer that term changed everything and then you know the kids getting more in the box and more um computerized you know they they just needed something to focus on if you if you really want to focus you're just going to go to the first guy and everybody else would have to do their research on the rest of the guys but i guess th that's that's my opinion you know do you do you think it also could have started with the miseducation of lauren hill too because that was so-called produced entirely and written by her but we kind of know that that was a really ugly situation yeah, yeah you might be exactly right and i think that's when it was like 
the producer is her, you know, and, and yeah, nobody that else was, that contributed was a really to it. Really bad situation, yeah. I think that that was the first time it came out in public. Yeah. I don't think that that's what dawned it. I, because I believe it was going on way before it, but I think that that was the first time that it actually was brought to the forefront. So yeah, let's let's big up somebody real real quick. Sure. How dope is Teddy Riley? Oh my goodness. Um. Not only did Teddy create his own sound with the New Jack Swing, and of course there were other people that were involved, but we know Teddy Riley for New Jack Swing. Teddy was one of the dopest producers to me because he didn't allow a genre to dictate who he was mm -hmm. um teddy had hits with cinnamon and boy george he had hits with uh high five big daddy kane big daddy kane the list goes on and on and they were all hot and they were all very valid and they they set the trend and the tone of the season that we were in. If it was winter, we had a song like um, I Don't Want to Fall in Love by Jane Child. But then mm -hmm. during the summertime, we had uh, Rump Shaker. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like Teddy was giving us what we needed when we needed it. So Teddy is one of the greatest. And people don't even know, like he did like Cool Mo D music. Like he did rap. He's been did. around for years. Yeah. I like the stuff he did with Today. Remember the group Today? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Big Bub. I, I definitely like that. So you go to the West Coast. Yes. Was it a struggle? Oh yeah, of course. My my first um, my first partner that got me out there. His name was D Mac. He was from New Rochelle, and uh, he sold two of our beats to a group, and um, that's how I got out there. And then uh, everything after that, pretty much just it was funny because I would walk from situation to situation, and um, I know it was a blessing. I know it was God that was helping me because I was so lost out there. I didn't know anybody out there. But um, after creating some relationships, yeah, it, it became less of a struggle and more of a grind, you know? So, production, um, there's so much equipment out now. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost boiling down to preference. But when we started producing, you had to have hardware. You was either MP60-2, MP60, SB-1200 person. What were you? When I got out to Los Angeles, I was using my boys... Uh, SP12. Okay. Um, the people that uh, were there for me when I first moved out there, Ty Cannon and his whole family, uh, they brought me in and uh, he had an SP1200 and I was going ham. Nothing right swings like the SP1200. There's nothing grittier, yeah. there's nothing grimier, the drum filters on there, everything. It's, it, it's one of the perfect drum machines. Yep. So, so you have that. What were you using to sample? Vinyl. Okay. No, I'm talking about what you were sampling in the SP-12 too, or you yes. was... Yes. Yep. Yep. Well, the people don't know how hard that is to do. <laughs> That's why I'm saying, if you were doing that, and, and, and don't try to tune it, because then you get like the ring modulation sound. No, but sound. see, we love that. You yeah, know, that's yeah, what made yeah, it dope. Yeah, that's what yeah. made it dope. Exactly. Like, um, for example, we could give them the beginning of Nas, The World Is Yours remix by Q-Tip. Yes. Q-Tip is that sound yes. that, we're, that we're talking about. Yes, that gritty. A lot yeah. of Easy Mobi stuff is definitely that sound. Um, yes. Flavor In Your Ears, that sound yes. that, that we're talking about. Um, The what? Yeah. He did the what? The what had that that grimy that sound that sound that yeah. sound. Mm -hmm. So um, you you started on that. Do you play keys? You play instruments also? Yes, sir. Yes. Do you do you uh, are you classically trained or are you trained by ear? Trained by ear now. Okay. Um, we started with piano lessons when I was young, and um, it was classical music. But um, I didn't I didn't go too far with that, and um, I just started learning by ear. My main thing was to get. I wanted to get busy okay. as soon as possible, you know what I'm saying? So I, I didn't want to sit there and be told I need to learn this, my proper fingering and hold this. And, no, I just wanted to go in. So how did you become, because when I look at your production and I listen to your production, you're almost perfect because oh my goodness, wow. you dope on the keys. Thank you. And your drums is incredible. Your bass, you, you'll pull out the bass and play it. Yes, sir. How did you put all of that together? Like, cause you know, sometimes somebody has a weakness. They might have a, you know, they could find a good sample, but their drums is not all of that, or their drums is crazy, but they don't have the good sounds. How did you become the complete package? I think when you turn around, and I appreciate that so much coming from you. Um, I think that 
the more you have meetings where people are saying, nah, that's not working, and you're getting fine-tuning. Mm -hmm. This is what it is. You have to embrace the constructive criticism. You have to embrace criticism, period, because it makes you better. Mm -hmm. And I had so many people that told me, you know, you're overly producing this record. Your drums are dope, but that music is whack, or your music's dope, but your drums are whack. Like, I've had all of that before. So I knew what people wanted to hear from me when I finally started moving in a forward direction. They wanted to hear my drums snapping. I'm in love with chords, so I'm going to make sure that there's chords around there that are going to complement the drums, but what's the driving force in all of my production has been my drums. So, And I've learned that out here in New York, you know, listening to all the greats, especially when I was in DITC. I lost my mind. These yeah, we was there the up. other day. Yeah, yeah, I lost my. I walked mind. in. I see Showbiz, the Lord Finesse. You, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's like that's what I'm talking about. I lost my mind, but these are people that help shape and mold the people that uh, you know my generation and the produ producers that I came up with. So, how does it feel that you 2016 you you still doing like a progressive boom bap like it's still boom bap but it's 2016 wow you don't sound like you've been in the basement for six years and how do you make it 2016 you have to adapt um dre taught me something that was pretty much uh the best thing that anybody could have ever told me and now it's pretty much my mantra you can't res uh, you can't expect new things doing the same old thing so I can't expect a new outcome doing the same old sound or whatever. So I've opened myself to collaboration. I, and I'm always going to be a student. Mm -hmm. I'm a for, forever a student. So I'm going to learn from the people that I look up to. And I'm going to look up to some of these young kids who are doing things and have the world by the ear. And, and I'm going to keep myself humble in that situation and, and, and learn from them and see what I can imprint in my sound going forward. 